So there's this internal voice that comes to you and says, you know, you're monster, you're terrible. You... <sighs> and here I have proof, here's my evidence. You did this and you did that. It comes to you at three in the morning when you can't fall asleep and you just, you can't even, you can't even, uh, you know, press mute. He's the voice inside your own head. And uh, it's painful. It's painful, you know, this, this, this internal voice who's mounting this case of how bad you've messed up and you've ruined your life and you've ruined other people's lives and he's got all the evidence. And the question is, for all the purported um, responsibility, you know, that's, that's, the, that's the lie. The lie is, well, I feel bad because I'm responsible. You know, if I didn't feel bad, I'd be irresponsible, right? So for all the ostensible responsibility here, I'm trying to be accountable, I'm trying to be responsible, I'm trying to take, trying to take, uh, trying to uh, be accountable to, what do we call it, the take, take responsibility for my actions, all, all of that stuff, which is, the, that's the, you know, ostensibly that's what it is. The reality is, the reality is, it doesn't actually lead to change. The reality is it doesn't actually lead to change. And in truth, the Alter Rebbe tells us in Tanya, the contrary, it actually leads to worse Avedas, worse sins, to the extent that it's a known psychological hack. What do I mean, what do I mean by known? The Yitzhahara, the evil inclination, knows it and uses it against us. It's a known psychological hack that if you want to get a Jew to do a big sin, all you have to do is start making them feel bad about a little sin. In the Alter Rebbe, chapter 26 of Tanya, he describes a guilt cycle. It's a vicious cycle. He says the, the, the voice of your conscience comes to you. And... Uh, it says, don't you remember that thing that you did? And you say, yeah, yeah, I do remember that. Well, wasn't that bad? Yeah, I have to admit that was bad. Well, don't you feel bad? Yeah, I do feel bad. Now, this whole thing, ostensibly, is a very holy, very religious conversation. You know? It sounds like an adult voice. It sounds like a responsible voice. It's coming to you to fix things and to... To, to draw your attention to something that needs rectification. So the, the what you're going to call it, the, the tacit agreement here, the, 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 the narrative is that this is, very, this is very responsible stuff and it's very religious and it's actually, it's even very holy. Now the reality is, what happens, al Rebbe describes this. You're in pain now. The guilt is pain. It's emotional pain which in, in many ways can be more difficult than physical pain. And, uh, well, you know, you don't want to be in pain. Who wants to be in pain? So we seek to counter the pain. What do we look for to counter the pain? We look for pleasure. So we're looking for pleasure to numb the pain, to escape from the pain. We're looking for pleasure. And it happens to be at this moment that I'm looking for pleasure, I have a poor opinion of myself because... I just reminded myself of how terrible I am and the kinds of awful things that I'm involved in, right? So I'm vulnerable because I'm in pain. I'm looking desperately for numbness, for relief. And I have low standards at the moment because I'm feeling low about myself. Well, tell me what that's a formula for. It's just a formula for disaster. So I go and I indulge in order to experience some type of relief. And when I indulge, I'm not being too picky. I, I don't have my normal uh, standards. Because after all, who am I? Who am I to have standards? You know what kind of person I am? And then I indulge. And then the, the, the minute after I indulge, I realize, what did I do? 
Well, that's worse than the thing that I originally felt guilty for. Okay. Now I'm really in pain. Well, what am I going to do? I'm in pain. I don't want to be in pain. How am I going to get out of this pain? So, distraction, numbness. You go look for more cheap thrills. And your opinion of yourself is even lower than it was before. And it's not hard to imagine how this just spirals downward and downward and downward and becomes a vicious cycle, which is very, very hard to break. So the, the Alter Rebbe says in Tanya that you have to know that when this voice comes to you, most of the time it's not authentic. It sounds like a responsible adult voice. It sounds even religious or even holy. But the actual effect, the actual effect is the exact opposite of what it's purporting to be. So, the Yetzirah is not going to come and tell a healthy person to do something blatantly destructive. I mean, what, 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 what are the odds that such a sales pitch is going to be successful? It's not what the Yitzhahad is going to do. What the Yitzhahad is going to do is going to come and tell a healthy person that I have evidence that you're unworthy. God doesn't even like you. I don't know how you like you. How do you stand yourself? And you're going to listen to him because his argument sounds so responsible and so holy. And from there... He's got you spiraling into a self-destructive pattern. Guilt, pain, indulgence, greater pain, greater indulgence. And just keeps on going over and over again. So we've got to break it. One of the things we were told to do in order to break it is to be businesslike in our in our response to that voice. To say, oh yeah? This is a genuine call to teshuva? You want to do repentance right now? Okay. Let's make an appointment. I'll meet you tonight. Around 11.30, I'm going to say bedtime shema, and I'll review my day, and let's talk about it then. You know what happens? 99% of the time, this nudnik, who was harassing you all day, talking about this, this nudnik in here, this internal voice, he was harassing you all day, and then when we had an appointment to sort it out, he doesn't even show. Because he was never concerned with sorting it out. He was concerned with using it as a club to emotionally pressure you and manipulate you into having a low self-concept, and thereby becoming vulnerable and doing worse and worse things that he can, in turn, create more <coughs> lower and lower self-concept with. So we tell him we're going to set an appointment. That's one thing. Another thing the alternative is, this is all chapter 26 of Tanya. He says, when you do show up for the appointment, let's say he does show up by some fluke. What are you supposed to think about? So he says, it's a time to be misbeinen, to meditate, to reflect. Upon the greatness of Hashem against whom he has sinned. It's a very powerful phrase. Don't meditate on the greatness of the sin. It doesn't say to be misbeinim gdulas hachet asher chatolay. Neged hashem. It doesn't say think about how big the sin was. It says think about gdulas hashem, the greatness of God, asher chatolay, against whom he has sinned. A couple of very rich ideas there. One is that. Uh, 
when it comes to sin, it's almost irrelevant what the sin was. Who cares what it was? It was a betrayal. Well, what was the betrayal? Now, you, now, now you're just looking to steal a cheap thrill. What was the betrayal? Yeah, describe it to me. Let's do a slow motion instant replay of the betrayal. You know what? Something tells me that you're enjoying this too much. No. It's, it's, not, it's not relevant. I know what I did. I could say it, can name it, I mean, to Hashem. But we don't have to go relive it vividly. We don't have to give it full color. It's almost irrelevant what the betrayal was. It was a betrayal. So does it matter that the particular form the betrayal took? It's irrelevant. What's relevant is it was a betrayal. And therefore, I should think about the one who I betrayed. I betrayed Hashem. So therefore, I want to think about how great Hashem is and therefore how much I value my relationship with Hashem. And therefore, any betrayal is unwanted. So that's one thing that's really, really helpful is that when we have stuff in our past that we don't like, stop thinking about the thing you did. Stop feeding it with mental energy and stop reliving it. You know, sometimes the so-called tshuva can be more dirty than the original sin. Because you have license to rethink it. Oh, no, God forbid, I'm not, I'm not, uh, it's, I'm not, I'm not uh, getting a vicarious thrill. No, but you are. In effect, you are. Just because you have a license to, uh, you know, it's like the censors who all watch, you know, the, 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 the obscenity because they, they're the censors. <laughs> you, know, you, know you, know you don't know that trick? Yeah, okay. The, the people who censor stuff to make sure that it's not dirty, those are, you know. No, you don't know about that? Okay. Anyways, it's human nature. It's in every community. Always the people who are on the lookout for, uh, for uh, lewd and lascivious behavior. You know? <laughs> don't worry, I'll find it. Well, <laughs> okay. Anyway, so that, that, that's one thing. You don't have to put yourself back in it. You don't have to relive it. Stop feeding it. Stop giving it energy. That's not important anyway. Think about the greatness of Hashem. Think about the one with, with whom you have a relationship. And then, as an incidental thing, yeah, okay, I betrayed Hashem. How did you betray Hashem? Okay, that's like a one-liner. That's like a one-liner. It, it's almost irrelevant what the, what the nature of the betrayal was. The point was, I'm in a relationship, and I did something that damaged the relationship. That's it. That's it. Okay. Another thing, though, when you think about the greatness of, uh, of Hashem against whom you've sinned, is this idea that, you know, sometimes that when ostensibly we're, we're trying to do tshuva, we actually psych ourselves out and we convince ourselves that it's impossible to do tshuva. Because here I was, I was trying to do tshuva, so I was thinking about what I did, and then I'm reliving it, I'm reimagining it, and it becomes this monster, it becomes this boogeyman. Right? Sometimes the, 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 the memory of it is more overwhelming than the original experience. I mean, it lasts a lot longer, that's for sure. The original experience lasts however long it lasts. But the remembering, the remembering, that's... And it never ends. The milking it, you know, the playing back the movie. So what happens, what ends up happening is we, we, we psych ourselves out, we convince ourselves, no, oh, there's no way to do tshuva here. This is not possible. This is insurmountable. So what we want to do is we want to flip it. Instead of telling God how big your sins are, tell your sins how big God is. Don't think about, this is such a big Aveda. How can Hashem handle it? That's not, that's not the right approach. Think about Hashem is so great. Hashem is so forgiving. Hashem is so kind. Hashem is so loving. My relationship with Hashem is so pervasive, so all-important. Oh, look at that thing that disrupted it. Yeah. We want to get rid of that. We want to remove that from our life because it doesn't belong there. And it stands a whole, it's, a, it's, it's a complete opposite approach. Okay, but I want to go a little bit deeper.
let's say we have a, a persistent thought that, look, you don't understand. It, it, it's not just about what I've done. It, it's, it, it's about who I am. It's much deeper than just a laundry list of offenses. You don't realize what kind of person I am. If you did, if people knew what kind of person I was, then they would understand that I'm kind of doomed to be stuck. Every Yom Kippur is a farce, because I know, I know good and well, that nothing's, nothing's changing, right? You know the difference between guilt and shame? Guilt is feeling bad about what you've done. Shame is feeling bad about who you are. So this, this is shame. This is even deeper than I feel bad about what I've done. This is, I feel bad about me. I don't like me. What I've done, that's just evidence of how bad of a guy I am. But what really I'm in pain about is me. There's a really tragic story in the, in the Talmud about one of the Chachamim who is sort of like, in some ways, the quintessential sinner. Because he was so high and he fell so low. Alicia ben Avoya, who they called Acher. Acher means somebody else. Because after he fell, he was like unrecognizable. He was like somebody else. And there are different accounts of how it happened to him. This is a Gemara in Kedushin that says he was traumatized by a uh, theodicy. You know why do bad things happen to good people? There are different explanations about what happened to him. But uh, the, the main description of it is uh, Gemara in uh, Hagiga, where it talks about four sages who entered this alternate state of consciousness, this elevated state of consciousness called the Pardes. And all of them were damaged by it, except for Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva was not damaged by it. But... Alicia ben Avuya had this like revelation, and then he uh, he came back. He couldn't assimilate the revelation into his regular consciousness, and he became a heretic. At any rate, the point is, there were a confluence of different things that happened to him. It wasn't one thing. The point is, it wasn't one thing. It, by the way, is it ever one thing? Is it ever one thing? It's never one thing. A bunch of stuff happened. In fact. There's, there's one opinion of stuff that happened to his mother. While, I mean, you could talk about, you know, like epigenetics there. Something that happened to his mother while she was pregnant with him. So there was, it's never one thing, okay? There were a whole bunch of different things. That's not the point. That's not relevant. What's relevant is he came to a point where he fell very low. Um, to the point, like I said, where he was unrecognizable. And he experienced... This really heartbreaking, I mean, just a, it's a heartbreaking moment, the way the, the Talmud describes it. But he hears a, uh, a heavenly voice issue forth. And it's speaking in the words of, of Jeremiah the prophet. Shuvu bonim shevavim. Return, O wayward children. That's the words of Yermio. Hanavi, who is rebuking the Jewish people, enjoining them to return to Hashem. So he hears a, a heavenly voice say these words, the words of the prophet, Shuvu bonim shevavim, chutz except you. <laughs> Everyone return. Hey, not you. Not so fast. Not you. He said, okay. Ebezei. If that's the case, if even heaven told me, give up, then I'm going to give up. And then he doubled down, and he really threw himself into his new life. There's a very interesting explanation of this story from the Dereshis Chachma. It's brought in the Shalah. <laughs> There's a, a seemingly unrelated Gemara in Psachim talks about etiquette. 
It says, Kol balabayas. Everything that your host, the, 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 the balabayas, the, the homeowner, tells you, I say, you should do it. Chutz mitzay, except for leave. There's a lot of different explanations of what does that mean, like, the balabas can't throw you out of his house, then what makes him the balabas? So there's different explanations. It means he can't send you on errands. He can't say, yeah, go to the store for me. Whatever. That's not, that's not the point. The point is that there, there's a, there's a Gemara that says, Kol balabayas say everything that balabayas tells you to do, you should do it, except for leave. Uh, whatever it means, it means. But Eishish Chochma says like this, the balabayas of the entire world is Hashem. So kol balabayas, anything the owner of the world tells you to do, the Ebishter tells you put on tefillin, the Ebishter tells you keep kosher, the Ebishter says keep Shabbos. I say, you got to do it. Whatever it says in Kitzur Shulchan Aruch, you open up a code of Jewish law, whatever it says to do, okay, Hashem said to do it, you got to do it, go argue. There's one thing that we don't have to obey. Chutz, with the exclusion of mitzay, go, tzay means go. Get out. You have to obey Hashem, anything He says, any command, except if He tells you, get away from me. So what was Alisha ben Avoya's greatest sin that he, not that he couldn't do tshuva from, let me correct myself, that in actuality he didn't, tshuva, he didn't do tshuva from. What brought him down? What was his what was his undoing? The sin that he didn't come back from. And he did every sin in the book. He did every sin in the book. But what was the one that he didn't come back from? The sin of believing that he was rejected by God. So any other sin he could have come back from. He actually could have come back from that sin, although it's a little bit uh, of a paradox. How do you... How does somebody who believes he's rejected by God insist that he's not rejected by God? I mean, that's sort of the nature of, of that sin. That was the one. I mean, that's why that's the one. You, once you're convinced that it's futile, once you're convinced there's no point, you're a goner. You could do anything else, and there's still life, there's still hope. Once you believe there's no hope for you, once you believe that Hashem doesn't even want you around, that's it. You're gone. And here's what I want to tell you. I never heard it explained like this. Maybe if I learned the Rishish Chochmah more carefully, I would find this is what he's saying also. But, I mean, we all know. I mean, this part I'm not making up. This is a known thing. Alisha ben Avuyo was a very frum. He was a very religious guy. He was, he was more than religious. He was, he was one of the Tanoim. He was one of the sages of the Mishnah. He was a big Talmud Chacham. I mean, that's to put it mildly. He was one of the great sages. It's like such... <laughs> How do I put this? How do I put this? If Maybe if he would have been a regular guy, he wouldn't have fallen so low. If he would have been a regular guy, maybe he would have sinned and got, gotten back up. But you see, when you have religious programming, and yeah, yeah, yeah. so you, you, you think of things in a really holy way. It's very holy. It's very holy. Now, when you fall, in the name of holiness, I'm writing myself off. You see? It's like, if he hadn't been such a sage, maybe he would have said, look, I'm a regular guy. What do you think? I'm perfect? I messed up. Let me, let me, let me come back. But no, it's when you're so holy, when you're so religious, quote-unquote religious, that you say, you know what? I am my own uh, you know, uh, religious police over here, and I am saying that this person, me, myself, I am just too big of a criminal, I'm too much of a, a danger to society, that's it. I have to be, I have to be written off. There's no, there's no hope for a guy like me. What, what I'm telling you, this is not a theoretical thing, I see this day in and day out. Day in and day out. The more religious they are, the more they believe God hates them. You want to you know, you borrow my phone? 
you can, you, can, you can answer my calls, and you can see the area codes, who's calling, and what they call about. I never put up a sign and tell everybody, on your worst day of your life, call Chase Taub. When you're feeling guilty, call Chase Taub. I never did. No, I never did. But these are the calls I'm getting. I want to tell you, the script writes itself. It's a classic script. Jewish people, people who are, who care about their Judaism, people who are making sure that they're giving miser, they're counting, making sure they're giving a tenth of their income to tzedakah, they clean out their whole home before Pesach. They would never light Shabbos candles after the 18 minutes. Always, you know, the time, extra time to spare. Very meticulous people, very diligent. And they're convinced that if anyone really knew who I really am, they would tell me there is no place for me in Judaism. So I'm going through the motions. <sighs> but I know already that I'm, I'm cut off. People live their lives like this. Decades. Decades. People raise their children. People have grandchildren. You have Bubbies and Zadies secretly believing that God has rejected them. And the whole thing is based on a religious narrative. The whole thing is very holy. Except that it actually flies in the face of everything that Torah tells us. It doesn't matter what you do. You're still a Yisro. You're still connected to Hashem. You're still indispensable. We still need you. You still have a role to play. You have a shlichus. You have a mission in this world. So th this, this is the first thing, you know. We've got to call out the guilt. We've got to call it out. We've got to call it for what it is. It's not making people feel more connected to Hashem. It's not people, making people feel like there are more possibilities in their spiritual growth. It's making people feel less connected to Hashem. It's making people feel they have less possibilities or no possibility in connecting to Hashem. So if that's what it's doing, you can give me all the religious arguments in the world that it's necessary and that it's holy and that it's charota, la'ova. You can, you can quote me anything you want from any holy book, but I see the results. The results are not leading to more mitzvahs. The results are not leading to more avas Hashem and yiras Hashem. The results are not leading to, to a more joyous life. The results are disconnectedness, isolation, self-loathing, drifting away from Hashem. So we have to identify it as the, as the, as the evil that it is. Okay, so Yem Kippur is coming. That's why we're having this whole uh, talk over here. So what are, we, what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do, Yem Kippur? <laughs> I'm supposed to go to shul. I'm supposed to say, shamnu, begadnu. And I'm supposed to pretend that anything's going to be different. We all know it's a joke. I did that last game, Kipper. So I'll go. I'll go because if I'm not, you know, they're going to ask where I was. Or at the very least, maybe my kids will ask why I didn't go to shul. So I'll go. We all know it's a joke because I did this last year, I did this the year before, I did it the year before that. So let's talk about it. Uh, 
every single day, three times a day. We daven Shemin Esu, we daven the, the prayer of 18 blessings. Now it's 19 blessings. And we make Abaracha with Hashem's name that Hashem is forgiving. That he is marvelous leach, he is abundantly forgiving. You're not, you're not allowed to make Abraha Levatalo. You can't use Hashem's name in vain. So, what are we doing? Making Abraha every single day, three times a day, that Hashem is forgiving if the whole thing's a farce. So, I want to tell you something. This is, if you want to see the source, how this is laid out very clearly. This is in Igeras HaTshuva, Simen Yud Aleph, or Perek Yud Aleph. It's the third Chelek of Tanya. 11th chapter, the third Chelek of Tanya. The Alter Rebbe explains very clearly. He says, first of all, if you hurt a person, and you go to ask that person forgiveness. That person is obligated to forgive you. Kamaru Bavakama says, even if you cut off a guy's hand, what are you supposed to do? You cut off his hand. You can't pay him back. I mean, there's remuneration that the court assesses, but I'm saying you can't give him his hand back. You can't, you can't make him whole again. You have to pay whatever you have to pay, but now afterwards you did it, and you go to the guy and you say, I'm sorry. Gemara says, he has to forgive you. And if you ask somebody three times to forgive you, and they say, no, I can't do it, now it's their problem. You know the story about David HaMelech with the Givenim? They didn't want to forgive. They refused to forgive. There was a violent attack against them, and they didn't forgive for it. And David HaMelech said, uh, we shouldn't mix with them, because one of the signs of the Jewish people is that they're compassionate and uh, if they're, they're so cruel that they refuse to forgive that uh, calls into question their whole uh, pedigree. What I'm saying is when it comes to human beings, Titus says a human being has to forgive. I know, now you're, getting, you're, you're adding that to your list of things to feel guilty about. <laughs> All the people you haven't forgiven. That's not the point here. The point is the Torah says that a person has to be forgiving. No matter what you did to him. So Hashem, who wrote this Torah, doesn't follow the same rules. I mean, this we know. That what Hashem tells us to keep are his laws. So he keeps the laws and he gives them to us so that we can be like him. So whatever he tells us to do is what he does. So he tells us if somebody asks you to forgive them, you forgive them. You don't think Hashem is as forgiving as the Torah that he wrote tells you to be? And to the contrary, like the Balatanya says, that with a human being, he has a finite amount of patience. Oh, you again. You're coming to, uh, again. You want to apologize again? <laughs> kind of getting tired of this, right? A human being has a finite amount of patience. But Hashem, who is infinite, I love the way the Altar Rebbe says it over there. He says that the Midas Harachamim, the attribute of compassion, the divine attribute of, com of compassion, is one of Hashem's Midas, and Hashem and His Midas are one. <laughs> it's, a, it's an interesting argument. Hashem and his attributes are one. And one of his attributes is compassion. Therefore, his compassion is synonymous or identical with him. And therefore, just as he is infinite, so too his capacity for compassion is infinite. So with a human being, maybe they get tired of forgiving you, even though they're required to forgive you. With Hashem, he's infinitely compassionate. He's not going to get tired. He doesn't get tired. 
So you ask yourself, how is it possible? I keep asking over and over and over again, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. Isn't he tired of it yet? Why do you think Hashem is tired? Hashem's not tired. Hashem has infinite patience, infinite capacity. So now you're going to say, how dare I go to Hashem on Yom Kippur when we went through this last year. A year ago I said I'm sorry. And now this year I'm going to go and I'm going to say I'm sorry again. So the Alter Rebbe says like this. He says, oh boy, you're coming to me that you're worried that you're a nudnik because you came to Hashem a year ago? <laughs> <laughs> something doesn't add up here. We go to Hashem every day, three times a day. So you're worried that you're a hypocrite because you, you went to Hashem a year ago on Yom Kippur, and that's what's troubling you? What about the fact that we go to Hashem every day, three times a day? The only difference, as the Alter Rebbe points out, is that the daily asking for forgiveness in Shemin is uh, like... It, the, 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 the tefillahs correspond to the, uh, to the karbonis, to the, to the offerings in the, in the temple. And so the tomid, the daily offering, was to atone for the omission of a positive commandment. And for avedis chamures, for grave offenses of a negative nature, so that requires Yom Kippur. But the, 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 the mechanics are the same. The mechanics are you go to Hashem, even though you've done it before, we've been here before, we, this is eerily familiar, right? Deja vu all over again. Here I am, standing here again. How can we be standing in the same place, same script, same words, same feelings? Isn't it a joke? And we're saying, it's not a joke. It's not a joke. So you're going to say, hold on a second. Hold on a second. I'm a scholar here, or I play one on TV, and I'm going to, get, I'm going to give you a religious argument that this doesn't work. There's always the religious arguments. It's always the religious arguments. I have a religious argument that's not true. It's not true that you can go to Hashem over and over again. You know why? Because there's a concept. Our sages talk about this in Gemara and Yuma that call me, Sha'imir, anybody who says, Echta, I'm going to sin, Vi'ashuv, and then later I'll repent. Sin now, repent later. Ein maspikin biyode la seis tshuva. He will not manage, literally, it will not come to his hand to do tshuva. So hold on a second. I know a thing or two. It says that if you do a sin, having in mind that tshuva is always a possibility, then tshuva will not work for you anymore. So therefore, checkmate. We shouldn't ask Hashem for forgiveness. The whole thing's a joke. So the Alter Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe knew how to learn. He heard of this Gemara before. He says, you want to know what that's talking about? <laughs> that's not talking about a person who keeps messing up, who's struggling with the same thing over and over again. That's natural. Of course people struggle with the same thing over and over again. It's a process. It's called a learning curve. Of course we do tshuva on the same stuff over and over again. Of course day to day, yim kippur to yim kippur, we find ourselves working on some stuff that we thought was in our past, and it came up again. I'm still, I'm a work in progress. I didn't finish this process yet. I'm still alive. I'm still alive. I'm still growing. That's a lot different than somebody who at the moment of temptation, you know what Oscar Wilde said? By the way, he's not a good person to, to follow his advice, but he had, he had good one-liners. <laughs> he said the best way to get rid of any temptation is to give in to it. <laughs> okay, that's not my advice to you. But anyways, 
Anyone who says, let me sin and I'll repent later, you know what that's describing? The Gemara is talking about a person. At the moment of temptation, he was weighing his options. He was saying, really, I shouldn't do this. Ah, but I just remembered something. There is a backup plan called tshuva. I got tshuva in my pocket. Now I'll go sin. Now he messed it up. Now he messed it up because there is a concept that ein keteger naisa sneger, that a prosecuting attorney cannot become a defense attorney. So what did he do? He took the concept of tshuva itself and used it to placate his conscience to get himself able to sin, to talk himself into doing a sin. He was on the fence and he said, ah, you know what? You know what tips the scales? In a negative way, God forbid. The idea of tshuva has convinced me it's okay, let me go sin. So he used tshuva as the argument to get him to sin. Now tshuva has taken on a role in his life of a negative thing because it got him to sin. Now later on he wants to use that same concept of tshuva to return. So it says, I'm sorry, sir. In your case, I'm a prosecuting attorney. I'm a witness for the... For the prosecution, I cannot be a witness for the defense. So he used tshuva itself to embolden himself to sin. That's what it means, kol mi ashuv. And by the way, you know what the Alter Rebbe says? And even if you do that, <laughs> even if you do that, and it's bad, it's bad, it's bad, yeah, we're all admitting it's bad. But even if you do that, you could still do tshuva from that too. No, the Gemara says you can't. It says, Ain must speak in the Yoda. You can't. Hold, hold your horses. It doesn't say you won't do tshuva. Ain must speak in the Yoda means it won't be convenient to do tshuva. A situation, a slam dunk opportunity will not present itself. See, normally, Hashem is constantly giving us easy opportunities to do tshuva because Hashem wants us to do tshuva. But if a person misused tshuva to be his, to be his, uh, to be the, uh, the tipping point to convince himself to go ahead and sin, so now, in my speaking, it's not, he's not going to manage, it's not going to come to him a, uh, a convenient opportunity. But the Alter Rebbe says, if he'll go and look for a chance, if he'll push the issue, and he'll say, you know what, I know Hashem's not going to make this easy on me, but I'm going to go and force the situation. I am going to find a way to do tshuva. The Alter Rebbe says, for sure he'll be able to do tshuva. For sure he'll be able to do it. And that's what, the, that's what the words mean. The words mean... All he did is he made it harder on himself later to do tshuva, which makes perfect sense, by the way. Think about it psychologically. Think about it psychologically. You know, if you, if you numbed yourself to the whole concept of tshuva by cheapening what tshuva is, by employing it in your, your, your scamming and scheming mentality... So then it's very hard later on to respect tshuva because you already proved to yourself it's a joke. But if you'll decide to take it seriously and realize, you know what? I can't really ruin tshuva. <laughs> tshuva is tshuva. I didn't ruin it. I maybe cheapened it for myself, but okay, I'll, 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 I'll reappreciate it. Then of course it'll work. Of course it'll work. There's an interesting uh, there's an interesting concept here, and and I just want to go one level, one more layer, one more, just one more layer deeper. And and, and that is not only is there nothing that can stop us from returning to Hashem. But on a deeper level, the whole notion that there's anything in between us and Hashem is, is, is an illusion. It's not real. 
the problem is that we don't know who we are. And if we knew who we were, if we had our identity clear, we would realize that nothing can interrupt, nothing can get between us and Hashem. There's a, there's a, there's a verse, it's in Parshish Kisava, but it's talking about the relationship between Hashem and the Jewish people. You know, the chosen people chose God to be their God. It's the, the, the old poem, how odd of God to choose the Jews, not so odd the Jews chose God. So it's, talk, it's talking about chosen people, they chose Hashem. So Hashem is he's using this word. I mean, the Meshur Rabbein is speaking, actually, it's, it's uh, Sefer Dvarim, it's Parshish Kisave. So Meshur is speaking, but he's speaking about the relationship between Hashem and the Jews. He uses this term, he says, Ha-Marto, Hashem Ha-Marto, Hashem who you chose, translating it chose, chose is not the best translation, distinguished, designated, set aside. And then Ha-Mircha, Ha-Mircha means, Ha-Marto means you chose Hashem, Ha-Mircha means Hashem chose you. Anyways, Rashi sometimes, he helps us with words that are unfamiliar, with uncommon words. In, in biblical Hebrew, and he tells us there that this word, I mean, the, the, the etymology, you would think it's like re- related to speaking, Aleph Memresh, Amira, speaking, it's not. He says not, it has nothing to do with that. He says, but it's not a common word in biblical Hebrew. We don't have, a, we don't have a, an easy parallel. To, usually when, you're, when you have an obscure word and you want to figure out what it means, so you find a similar word somewhere else and you compare it, and then by context you figure it out. So he says, we don't, have, we don't have another word like that in, in, in Tanakh. He says, but it, basically it means separation. It means hafrosha. It means when you separate or designate, you make something unique. So it means that Hashem designated the Jewish people for a special relationship, and the Jewish people designated Hashem for a special relationship. He says, however, he says, but if you want to know, I've, there is a similar, a similar word. In, in, in Tehillim, so David Melech says, Yisamru kol pe'alei oven. The sinners gloat. The sinners take pride in themselves. Yisamru kol pe'alei oven. The sinners are proud of themselves. It means pride. So it means we're proud of Hashem, and Hashem is proud of us. So the sicha from the Lubavitch Rebbe, Lekut Yisicha is chelik test, Parshish Kisavit. Asks a bunch of questions, but I'll just tell you two of the questions. One of the questions is, first of all, why did Rashi tell us that we don't know what the word is, and then later on he finds a comparable word in Tehillim? Apparently there is a, a word. The other thing is, I mean, it's not a bombshell question, but it's just kind of weird. Like, the word means chosenness. The word means a special, unique relationship. And the one context he f- found for it is a really negative verse in Tilm, where David and Melech is lamenting how the sinners are gloating, are proud of their sins. Yisamru kol pe'ale oven, that the sinners are proud of their sins. Like, what's haste? What's going on here? It's just a little bit unsavory. It's like, you couldn't find a nicer verse. So the Rebbe explains it like this. He says, you have to know who you are. You did something, you shouldn't have done it. Okay, it's not you. That's not you. I know, that's like nowadays cancel culture, right? Everybody gets busted. At some point, they're going to dig into your Twitter and they're going to find something inappropriate you said 10 years ago, 20 years ago, right? And then what is the, if you have a publicist, what is your publicist going to tell you to say when you get busted? You're going to say, those comments are not a reflection of my values. This is not who I am, right? That's that's what the publicist tells you to say. This is not who I am, right? I want to tell you something. You sinned. We have it on video. Everything's on video. No, I don't mean just because they have uh, video cameras everywhere in New York now. I mean, Pirkei Yovis says... Hashem has everything on video and audio. Everything's recorded. You sinned. We have the evidence. We know you did it. You can't deny it. 
And I want to tell you something. Even so, you stand up and you say with confidence, it's not me. <laughs> what do you mean? That's it. You're on tape. That's, that's not who I am. What do you mean it's not who you are? That's you. That's you an hour ago. How can you say that's not who you are? So here's what you have to understand. What is the special relationship that Hashem chose us for? What does it mean, Hamircha, that Hashem chose you, designated you, established a unique relationship with you? Rashi says it means hafrosha, it means separation. What does separation mean? Separation means that whatever you're involved in that is not consistent with your true identity as Hashem's loyal, beloved servant, whatever you're involved in that is a betrayal of that relationship is not you. You are separate. You are intrinsically, inherently separate from it. It's not you. Did I do it? Yeah, I did it. But who... I know this sounds philosophical, but who's the real me? The guy who did that? That's not the real me. That's not the real me. You want to see the real me? Open me up. Dig inside. Go deeper. Find the real me. You know what you're going to find? You're going to find Hashem. That's the real me. We have a technical term for it. We call it Yechida. Yechida means oneness. It's the deepest level of the soul. It's not even a level. Because a level implies a part. It's not a part. It's the essence, the essence of who you are, and that is oneness with Hashem. Yechida means yachid, one, one with Hashem. We talk about nefesh, which is the level of the soul which animates behaviors, and ruach, which is the energy behind our emotions, and neshama, which is the energy behind the intellect. Chaya is a spiritual energy that gives us our spiritual life, our capacity for, for altruism and self-sacrifice. And then there's yechida, the fifth level, which is not a level, which, was, which is the essence, and it's oneness with God. So... Yom Kippur is the day, Achas B'Shana, one time a year, where we daven five times. Each time we daven corresponds to another level of the soul. A normal day, we access three levels. We daven three times. Rishchid is Shabbos. Yom Tif, we have a fourth prayer, Musaf, so we can access that fourth level of Chaya. Comes Yom Kippur, we access the level of, level of Yechida. And what does it mean to access the level of Yechida? It means like this. I'm not denying it happened. I'm not denying I was there. I'm not denying that the guy looks like me. I'm not denying he was using my body and my energy. And, 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 and when he did the sin, he was burning calories from the breakfast that I ate. Yes, I admit it all. But that's not me. That's not me. I'm separate from that. So that's what it means that that the relationship between you and Hashem is one of separation. What does that mean? In part, what it means is you are separate from all that stuff that, that, that happened on a level of nefesh, of ruach, neshama, even chaya. You're separate from that. That's not you. You're already, you're above it. You're above the fray. You transcend that. That's not you. That never became incorporated into you. It can't. It's incompatible with your essence. Like oil and water, it doesn't mix. It never became you. So the fact that you betrayed God, we're talking about that before, right? To think about the greatness of God against whom we've sinned, to think about it as a betrayal. There's another whole level of this betrayal, which is to realize that essentially any betrayal of God is a betrayal of myself. It's not God wanted something and I wanted something different, and I went and I did what I wanted instead of what he wanted. That's not the true narrative. That's, that's, the, that's the facade. That's the very superficial narrative. It looks like that. I get it. I understand why it looks like that. That's not what happened. What happened is Hashem and me wanted the same thing. And I'm the one behind enemy lines. He's safe. I'm the one trapped here in a body with this voice embedded in my head which we spe spoke about before, even gets to use religious arguments to confuse me. And I messed up, and I betrayed myself, because that thing that I did is not true to me. 
And to the extent it is, not, it is not true to me, it is not me, it is a betrayal of myself, it never became part of me. It never became incorporated into me. And therefore, and therefore, you know what it is to me? You know what, you know my, you know what my attitude toward my own, quote unquote, my own sins is? You know what my attitude is? Didn't change me. Never, ch- can't change me. It can't touch me. It can't touch me. That's what Yechida means. It didn't change me. Hashem put it in my life because He wants me to create a very special kind of light. The Yisuna Oyer Minachoshech. Shleim Melech said that I saw that there's an advantage of wisdom over folly, like the adv- advantage of. Light over dark. So the simple meaning is, I see light is better than dark. Okay, does it take the wisdom of Solomon to figure out light is better than dark? You know, go get up in the middle of the night and try to go get a glass of water without turning on the lights. You're going to realize light is better than dark. So then there's another way of explaining. No, means, relatively speaking, if you're in the dark, then you appreciate the light. Okay, that's a little bit deeper. That's a little bit more wise. But that's not, what, that's not even what it really means. Because that's only subjective. That's, well, now I see, so, so because I was in the dark, I appreciate the value of light. Yeah, but this, the light is still just as bright, just feels brighter. Yisun Oyer Min HaChoshech, this explains, means the special advantage, special Yisun Oyer, special advantage of the special kind of light, Haba Min HaChoshech, that comes from dark. Light that was fashioned out of darkness. So there's light light, regular light. And then there is special light that was made out of dark. I don't think there's a physical parallel. At least scientists haven't discovered it yet. Light that's made out of dark. But imagine this room, if all the lights are off. And you, you know, hold up a light meter like the photographers have. You measure how much light's in the room. Zero. I'm sure it's not zero. There's going to be something. But, uh, you know, at one time, <laughs> I wore night vision goggles. Uh, and an uncle who was working on a project for developing uh, night vision goggles for the first uh, Gulf War. So in order to use them, we had to go into the closet and shut the door because if you stand, if there's any light, it's too much light, they don't work. So, the, so we, we went to the closet, and, like a pantry, the kitchen pantry, and shut the door. And then it worked. He says, you know how it's working? He says, because there's a crack of light coming through the under the door. So just a tiny bit of light, then, then, you can, uh, then it works. Anyways, so there's always a little bit of light. Let's say you turn off all the lights here in this room, and we hold up a light meter. Okay, so then you know, very, there's very little light. And then all of a sudden, we turn on all the lights. Ah, and we take a light meter, and we measure how bright it is. Very bright. Okay. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is, imagine we measured the darkness... And then somehow we were able to take that quantity of darkness and transform it into light. That the darkness itself, not that the darkness is replaced by light. The darkness is transformed into light. So now we have the quantity of darkness that is now light. And now we turn on the lights. So on top of it, we have the regular light and we have the darkness which which turned into light. Okay, so what am I describing here? Like I said, there's no physical phenomenon which is a parallel to it, but psychologically we can all, we can all relate to this. There's light light and there's dark light. The light light are the moments of your spiritual highlight film. The moments when you know you did good and you're proud of what you did. That's regular light. Then there's Yisuna Oyer Min Those spiritual treasures of intense closeness with Hashem, which were born at your lowest spiritual moment. This is what our sages call the phenomenon of zdeines nasalei kezachias. That sins, zdeines, by the way, sins, and there are a lot of words for, for sin in the holy tongue. Zdeines means something you do on purpose. It means a malicious, a wanton sin. I know it's wrong, and I'm doing it anyway. So the worst, most egregious type of sin becomes like a merit. You know who said that, by the way, in the Gemara? Gemara Nyuma, 
Resh Lakish. <laughs> Resh Lakish was one of the sages. He himself was a Balchova. He had become a, he fell very low. He became a bandit. He was a robber. Then Rabbi Yechenon was makar of him. He brought him back. He saw his potential. So he, he was a living embodiment. That was his biography, was Dainus Nasalei Kazachius. That when you come back, all the squandered potential, it's not that you just stop squandering it, but you come back and you repurpose it, and all of the experiences from previously in life, all those low moments, all the, the moments of, of your greatest uh, shame, you, you look back and realize, hold on a second, hold on a second, hold on a second. Is the purpose of religion that I should feel holier than thou? That I should feel, you know, sanctimonious self-righteousness? Look how good I am. No, that's not the purpose of religion. The purpose of religion is to be close to God. Okay, so therefore I should value anything that brings me close to God. You want to know what brings you close to God? I promise you. Doing something good brings you close to God. And doing something bad brings you close to God. Now, don't purposely go out and do the bad things because call me we already know about that, right? Can't purposely do it. But when it happens, that's Yisuna Oymen Achoshech. That's the darkness that gets turned into light. So this is what the Rebbe says. This is the, the, the Sikha from Chelek uh, Tess. Look at the Sikhas. Parshish Kisave. First, Rashi has to tell us, Hamarta, Mircha, that the relationship is separation. Not just Hashem separated you for himself, but he separated you from all of that stuff that you were never, that wasn't the real you. You were not involved in it. It never changed you. It never, it never touched you. So you're separate from that stuff. Once you realize who you really are, that you are uncorruptible, not just uncorrupted, you're uncorruptible, not shaykh to corruption. It cannot happen. Once you realize that, now you realize, Yisamru kolpele oven. Right, that was that verse where Rashi found in Tehillim a similar word, Yisamru kolpele oven. We were saying, whoa, 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 what is he talking about? Sinners gloating and being proud. It's a hidden message. You know what it means? It means when you can come to a point where you can actually be proud of the fact that you have an imperfect story. That the pele oven, that the people who got involved in sin can be proud of their story. Now, it doesn't mean you have to rent a billboard <laughs> and tell other people. And, but, by the way, mostly only because you know that it's a mitzvah to publicize who did mitzvahs. Like when the rich guy gives money, you put a, put a, a plaque. Not for him, but so other people will do, do the same thing, right? So we don't want to go around telling people about our Avedas because... We might give them ideas. <laughs> Even though we did tshuva, we're over it already. We're, we're, it's behind us, but we don't, we don't want to trigger anybody. So we don't, we don't go around bragging about it. Obviously not. But this is what it means. Was the purpose of religion that you're supposed to feel like a holy guy? Or was the purpose of religion in order to be able to serve Hashem, to bring value to Hashem, to give nachas and pleasure to Hashem? Okay, so I'm telling you something. That the making up and the reconciliation that comes after apparent separation is also something that brings great pleasure to Hashem. And truth be told, it's the main bulk of what we were sent to this physical universe to accomplish. The main bulk of what we were sent here for is the, 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 the work of dealing with temptation and, and distraction. Like the the Bedichever one time, he complained. He told the Ebishta, he says, what did you do? You made the world in such a way that when a person wants to sin, he looks, walks down the street and he sees temptation. And when he wants to do uh, tshuva, he has to go read a book. You should have flipped it. <laughs> you should have made it. You walk down the street and you see ways to do tshuva. And if you want to be tempted, you'd have to go, you know, get a library card and go, you know, go take out a book, you know, go research <laughs> it. Right? Then nobody would sin. 
I sound a copaly of it. If you know who you are, if you know your identity, if you know that the stuff that you were involved in was not you, it never touched you, it cannot corrupt you, then what do you do with your story? What do you do with your past? Be proud of it. Again, proud doesn't mean you go around telling it to people. But between you and Hashem, you cherish that. You cherish that. Because that's, that's a real relationship. That's a relationship where you realize nothing can separate us. Nothing can get between us. Why can nothing get between us? Ultimately, because I am you and you are me. So it's wild and you're not allowed to go purposely do it. But how do you see the fact that you and Hashem are inseparable? You are Hashem, Hashem is you. How do you see that level of absolute yechida, of, of unity, where we cannot break away from each other? How do we see it? By going through moments of spiritual bankruptcy. And realizing even that can't separate us. You know, you hear this, this way of looking at it, and you can even understand why it says in some places that kol mishayma echt ve'oshuv, you know what it actually means? <laughs> another, another pshat. That when a person learns how great tshuva is, he's going to purposely do avedas just so he can have an opportunity to do tshuva. Anyways, anyone here needs to do that? <laughs> you don't have what to work with already? <laughs> we, we have plenty of material, I'm saying. We don't have to go and, uh, and do sins in order to have what to do tshuva with. So what did I say at the beginning with the 30-second version? I don't remember exactly, but it was something like that the biggest interference with our the relationship with Hashem is the, the religious excuse that somehow guilt is, is helpful or necessary and that the sooner we can get over it, get past it, the sooner we can really connect. And deeper than connecting, we can realize that we're one with Hashem. We're truly one. If you dig deep, that's what Yom Kippur is. Yom Kippur is coming in what, 48 hours? Less than 48 hours. We'll be standing here. Kol Nidre will be in that, that sacred space, that sacred time. What, what's the message? What's the message of, of, of Yom Kippur? You know what the message is? The message is, it doesn't matter what happened. None of that can touch you. It can't touch you. It didn't change you. Nothing can come between you and Hashem because you are one with Hashem. I want you to understand what I'm saying here. I'm not telling you you're all beautiful, God loves you. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying much more than that. I'm saying if you dig deep enough and come to your essence and your truest identity, you will find you are no different than Hashem. So it's not just Hashem forgives you, Hashem loves you, Hashem will mend his relationship with you. I'm telling you, you cannot choose a relationship with Hashem any more than you can choose to be yourself. <laughs> you, can't, you can be in denial of your identity, just like you can be in denial of your relationship with Hashem. But you cannot choose whether or not you are connected to Hashem any more than you can choose whether or not you are you. That's what it means in essence. Essence means something that cannot change, does not change, cannot be any other way. Our connectedness to Hashem is our essence. Therefore, anything that appears as less than connectedness is superficial, is incidental, will eventually disappear when Mashiach comes, Hashem says, I'll get rid of all the impurity. It won't be left. It'll be gone without a trace. And the only thing that'll be left is the truth. 
that we are one with Hashem. So you're going to let your past, you're going to let the lowest moments, your shameful moments, your cringe moments, you're going to let those tell you who you are? You're going to let those define your identity? Those moments are not your identity. Those moments are an opportunity for you to rise up and reclaim your identity and to say, none of that is who I am. It never was. Even, a, even at the, and it, as hypocritical as this sounds, even at the moment I was doing it, it wasn't me. And I'm not saying it as an, ex, as an excuse. God forbid to make anybody take sin in a, in a, in a cavalier way. But to the contrary, to the contrary, what I'm telling you is, this is not to make people to, 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 to be blasé in their, in their service of Hashem. To the contrary, what I see is that the reason people have a cavalier attitude is the opposite. They've given up, they've classified themselves as failures, they know that they're irredeemable, and then they have a cavalier attitude towards Yiddishkeit. When you realize you're not getting away, you're not getting away from him anyway. You cannot mess it up anyway. It doesn't matter how far you fell. You cannot get away from him anyway. He is you. You are him. You can't get away from yourself. Then we have some hope. Then we start to value the good things that we're doing. Then we actually have the guts to make a New Year's resolution to try to take something on meaningfully, even if it's something small. we got one day a year to remind us who we are. So powerful. One day a year. And we're not lying to ourselves. Remember, remember what it feels like to know who you really are. And if the religious voice, the sanctimonious voice, comes to you throughout the year and tries to tell you anything different about yourself, please identify that voice for, for the absolute foolishness that it is. Shova is as natural as breathing. Being one with Hashem is, is, our, is our native state. Everything else, it's an act, it's a play. We have one day a year where we're, where we're, not, we're not playing anymore. And what happens on that day? I'm talking about Yim Kippur, where we are, the, 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 where I am who I really am. What happens automatically? The sins disappear. Because when I am who I really am, the sins are gone. Because they never, they never affected who I really am. Please don't forget who you are. Please don't forget who you are. And if you're a parent, please remind your children who they are. Okay. All right. Gemar Chasimah Teva to everyone.